Thank you, Alicia. It's now my great pleasure, pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Emdy. Um, Professor Robert Emdy is Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and currently serves on the faculty at the Centers for American Indian and Alaskan Native Health in the Colorado School of Public Health. His CV, if anyone's seen it, you need about five days to read it. <laughs> It lists over 300 publications in the fields of early socio-emotional development, sleep research, infant mental health, diagnostic classification, early moral development, evaluation of early childhood intervention, psychoanalysis, behavioral genetics, and research education. He served as president of the World Association of Infant Psychiatry and Allied Dis Disciplines from 1986 to 1989 and currently serves as Honorary President of WAM. He has also served as President of the Society for Research and Child Development and on the boards of many organisations that deal with infant development, mental health and research training. In addition, Bob's work has evolved into a phenomenon which I think could be called the Bob Effect. He has practised what he has preached. He has used himself as a tool, and many, us, many of us from all over the globe have met Bob in person via his written work. I remember sitting in the library in New Zealand saying, oh, who is this man? And being deeply moved and challenged by this work. And as I've gone about saying about today's presentation, many other people all around the world have had a similar experience, so I think we might have to do some research on the Bob effect. These memorable, affecting moments of meeting have inspired us. They've stretched us from the inside out and changed how we practice, research, think, and how we meet babies and their families. So today is an extraordinary day for us as we get to be together, actually in person, with Bob the man, and share this time together. So today, Bob, invites us, true to himself, to journey with him as he presents to us his plenary. And the title of his plenary today is Infant Psychiatry and the Origins of Wayne. Remarkable early contributions that energized our field. So welcome, Bob. Timer here. Yeah, it's okay. I'm mic'd so I can walk on the stage and look at you all, see what's going well or not. <laughs> uh, I hope this will be fun and I hope it'll be uh, a stimulation for our thinking and our discussions because it's about our history. And uh, I'm especially uh, honored to have that lovely introduction, but especially to uh, follow the wonderful award and comments with Alicia Lieberman, uh, who is so um, appropriately uh, uh, and compellingly in the tradition of the messages that I want to have us think about uh, in the tradition of Renee Spitz, and Selma Freiberg, and many others. Um, so as you heard, I want to talk about the fact that this is our 15th uh, Congress, and I want to talk about the first two, which were called Infant Psychiatry and Infant Psychiatry and Allied Disciplines, and uh, talk about and revive the excitement of that and how it came about, what led up to it, uh, it's part of our history, what persists, what pervades, uh, and that's what I want to talk about uh, and have us reflect about. I wonder if you could, any of those who were in Portugal in 1980 or in Cannes in 1983, could you raise your hands? I just want to see what proportion. Yes, see, look around. Probably, maybe less than 5%, maybe less than, much less than that, of you were there. 
and uh, some of you were, uh, importantly, and uh, it was a special excitement of a coming together there, and I want to uh, bring a bit of that alive and, and talk with you about it. So, as I said, this is the 15th Congress, and you can see uh, the ones that I have bold, in bold uh, are the ones before we joined uh, the wonderful other organization that Selma Freiberg also uh, was a inspiring founder of the International Infant uh, Mental Health Association. Uh, that occurred in 1992, but beforehand was this infant psychiatry. What was it? And I'm going to feature those first two meetings, as I mentioned. And the remarkable volumes that resulted from those that really had quite an influence called the Frontiers of Infant Psychiatry. As you can see, edited by Justin Cole, Eleanor Galenson, and Robert Tyson. Uh, Eleanor Galenson is no longer with us. Justin Cole, I wasn't able to access. I'm not sure what state of health he's in now, but I did talk with Bob Tyson about some of these beginnings, and he's still quite active and around. Uh, so, uh, there's one memory I want to share with you right at the outset that keeps reverberating with me from there, from those meetings. At the first meeting, Eric Erickson, he presented, um, as you know, uh, a version uh, of his thinking of the psychosocial stages. Do you remember the eight stages with the conflicting issues? Uh, uh, at first, anchored to different points in the lifespan. One of his points in his talk was we need to do more beyond infancy and what do we do and the consequences and how do we work with it and the developmental process beyond. And I'll come back to that later. But this reverberating memory is <clears throat> Eric Erickson puts up his stages and then he puts up a tapestry, a matrix. And he says that his wife uh, told him, who was a weaver, that you really have a matrix of life here. And uh, I think really what you mean is you have these issues that reverberate throughout the lifespan. And so he developed his thinking then and showed for the first time this tapestry throughout life. And I have a version of it, but uh, it's more to just have you imagine what it's like. So each of these issues are psychosocial uh, conflicts, and they're really psychobiological social conflicts. Uh, and issues uh, are there throughout the lifespan. They have ascendancy as he uh, developed his thinking uh, at different points in the life, but it's not as though that's it, uh, a reverberating memory. Uh, so the theme of this talk really, as I delved into this, I was wanting to share why psychiatry, you must wonder many of you were so multidisciplinary, why psychiatry? Uh, as, and, but as I went into rereading and thinking about this, I realized something even more. It really should have been called, if you were going to name it, uh, infant psychoanalysis. Well, that would have led to more mischief, as you might imagine, with the general public. <laughs> people thinking of babies on couches and people not listening to, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, and, and just theorizing, and so on. So, uh, they decided, no, they chose psychiatry, Bob Tyson told me uh, just recently, because they wanted to get away from the image of just uh, simple treatment. They thought psychiatry was a broader discipline and so on. But of course, uh, in many ways, many of us are disappointed that it's become somewhere. Uh, so as the science has continued, we haven't developed the continuing science of relationships in relation to psychiatry, it's become less broad in some ways uh, now, but then that was the case. Uh, but I was surprised, as I think you'll see in a minute, how many of the main speakers at this fundamental coming together meeting in 1980 and 1983 were psychoanalytically trained, over half of them. You'll see the names in a minute. So. As I began to reflect more and more about this talk and what I wanted to 
uh, reflect for us in our history. I realize this is a talk about meaning, and it's about clinical meaning, especially. And I think that's the theme that pervades our uh, ourselves in, in this field, in the uh, World Association of Infant Mental Health. It was a beginning there, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the history, which many of you may not know what a struggle, what a struggle it's been and was, and what a thrill it was to come together in multiple disciplines in those times. And I'm going to use the metaphor of the arc of history, because I'm going to skip over pretty much from those times to now, to where we are now, and lead up to the presidential symposium, hopefully if I'm interpreting that right. But I think I am hearing all the dialogues during these meetings. So here's uh, my outline. I'm going to spend a little bit of time reminding us of the two decades leading up to this Frontiers of Infant Psychiatry convening. It was a two decades of recognition, painful and difficult recognition of suffering in infancy and of the recognition that infants really have a lot to offer on their own in terms of adaptation and positive development. It wasn't just needing to be cared for, and that's that, obviously. For But that's, there was a lot of the, our culture that said that. And also a history of recognition that effective clinical activity could take place and make a big difference. And so, uh, and then I'll move on to the watershed uh, frontiers of infant psychiatry, the, and especially then take note of the coming, the big coming together where we became WAME with the uh, practitioner oriented groups, uh, again, stimulated also by Selma, but focused in Michigan, but already international that we joined. Much of the leadership for that with High Fitzgerald is with us. Uh, and continued, and then I want to move to Meaning and Frontiers today uh, and the arc of history, as I mentioned. And I will return to some prescient discussions that I remember of Eric Erickson again, where he told us, what are we going to do about the biology and development? And he talked about morals. Use some different language, but that's okay. And some questions for us leading up to the presidential symposium. So now the recognition, and I want to say about some pioneers, uh, and use the demarcation of the Frontiers of Infant Psychiatry, those two books. The first Congress and volume was dedicated to the memory of Rene Spitz. You see the years of his lifespan there. Uh, he died before these began. Uh, the second was to the memory of Selma Freiberg, who participated in the first Congress in 1980. I'll tell you more about that a bit. But who died not long thereafter. And you'll hear more about that in the connections. So this is Renee Spitz. Uh, I was pleased early in my career, extraordinarily privileged to say the least, of having him as a mentor. Uh, and I'm not going to emphasize that so much. But he was a pioneer an enormous pioneer in this recognition. As most of you know, with his films, he pioneered in filming uh, circumstances of infants raised under adverse conditions that could be corrected with um, an, aware an awareness of the suffering and what led to it. Interestingly enough, uh, on the psychoanalytic theme, there's a convergence with Freud. Uh, Spitz actually uh, went to Freud with Forenzi, and uh, he said, uh, he used to jokingly proud about himself, say so he would go, Forenzi took him to Freud, and he went to Freud and he said, oh, this psychoanalysis works so well with sick neurotics, uh, it pro probably could work well with me, you know, I'm a normal person but, uh, for a training. And so we always blamed him for uh, the training analysis, which you have to go through in psychoanalytic training. He was the first. Uh, and he has many stories about that, he, uh, including one of the famous cases he would bump into, Wolfman. Uh, but uh, incidental, but not 
incidentals that so much of psychoanalysis dealing with meaning in the inner worlds of self and other and self with other uh, were so influential. And now you will recall, most of you, the classic works of Rene Spitz, published in the Psychoanalytic Study of the Child, 1945-1946, on grief and depression. A hospitalism paper, which was a paper in uh, orphanage institutions, uh, multiple caregivers. Uh, it was inadequate in many ways, but it's still ongoing. We had uh, evocations of that in the last plenary wonderful lecture by Dr. Bakerman's uh, uh, Croninen, uh, and uh, they're still ongoing, as we saw in that. Um, but for the most part, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Uh, the other syndrome paper was anaclytic depression, where Spitz did his observation in a prison nursery for women. At that time, the eugenics movement was holding sway uh, in both of these settings. Uh, in this prison nursery, uh, they want, the idea of eugenics was, of course, uh, now debunked, but uh, almost wholly that uh, the genes uh, resulted in what we now see as social inequalities, uh, the poverty, uh, people um, having early forms of criminality, which included loose women. And a lot of the women in this prison nursery uh, had uh, births out of wedlock, so they were considered uh, problematic from a eugenics point of view. And you, they, so they would be allowed to be with their babies in this place, and they were separated at different times so the women could do their time uh, and the babies were separated to eventually probably go into a quote-unquote good home. But Spitz used this experiment in nature, as it were, like the other one. <clears throat> in the other one, he documented severe forms of depression. In this one, uh, he documented different times of separation and its consequences to the babies, uh, and indeed showed that uh, separation uh, after six months of bonding and being with the mother had enormously different consequences, was apt to result in depression. He called it anaclytic depression, leaning on the physiological, biological functions of necessity and nurturing with mothering. Uh, and actually, he had some influences on adoption procedures, particularly in Europe at that time, or the United States, uh, already to not, if you were going to do adoption, have them as early as possible uh, in situations. But otherwise, as you'll hear, uh, there were problems in his work being accepted. Uh, and he showed, in terms of treatment as well, that the, not only the timing of separation and adoptions, but the fact that re reuniting with mothers in his films, the grief that probably, uh, hopefully, many of you have seen, shows that as well. Reuniting, reuniting with the mother uh, under those circumstances and other more typical circumstances is what led to a recovery of the depression, optimally, particularly with support. But interestingly enough, oh, and you'll remember some of the horrible uh, pictures in those movies. Uh, they were tough to watch, and they still are. Uh, well, Spitz's findings, in spite of what I've just said, were controversial. Uh, difficulties were pointed to in the uh, major psychology literature of the days, particularly in the next 10 years, uh, particularly by a man named Pinot, wrote in the Psychological Bulletin, the leading critical journal in psychology at the time, and pointed to uh, major scientific problems. But the difficulties, as we understand it now, and certainly I do, and we as clinicians, even more profoundly, were emotional. So um, the Pinot controversy uh, in the psychological bulletin, it's really interesting to read and reread this controversy. It raged. It had all kinds of letters and responses. Spitz responded, and other people responded. But, the uh, main message for the psychology of the time, which was heavily influenced 
by, not just by eugenics, but by learning theory uh, and information processing theories, uh, behavioral theories, not on the inside, uh, were uh, as follows. The, there was an adequate description. Uh, Spitz hadn't described adequately the environments in these two cases, uh, so it was hard to know how it would generalize. Uh, reliability of assessment, criticism of the hetzer wolf the Viennese tests that didn't have the psychometrics that uh, we've, we've all come to expect now. Um, and uh, actually, this work probably wouldn't have been published now without a lot of peer review and revision. Uh, and validity, validity of all kinds, internal and external. Won't go into all the issues. Interestingly, the dialogue went back and forth. Even Yuri Braun from Breder, who had some, was one of the early defenders of Spitz's work, it was at the level of methodology of this kind, as opposed to the next thing, which is, uh, and Spitz didn't even come up with this. I mean, I realized, immersed in this work with so many others and colleagues, a different picture. And that has to do with clinical meaning. Spitz was a clinician. This is what happened. How? Oh, it says here, that first line, his findings were replicated in a number of settings, different ways. So I would, teaching this with students, say, well, how did that be? How could that be? It was replicated. Well, he used his clinical meaning skills. We are trained to use pattern perception, look at syndromes over time. Moreover, he used himself, as we are trained to do, hopefully now. So he saw these babies. He saw the classic expression that Darwin described, the omega and so on, of the face of depression, and the immobility. He felt the sadness, the pain, and the depression. He also used other parts of the pattern perception that we're trained to use clinically to, in a sense, make a formulation, if you will. It, over time, related particularly in the hospitalism work and other observations with families to the time of separation in development. It was related to separation and even the time developmentally of separation. And he saw also you could make a difference if you supported a reuniting of the baby with mother or caregiver, uh, he used that. And that that is so profoundly our clinical meaning. And we need to keep that and not lose touch of it. And so much of that came up in our discussions in this Congress. But we, we need to be aware of our history. Uh, depression, uh, these things were not able to be recognized by the general fields uh, that we are immersed in. Uh, depression in child psychiatry in the United States, North America, was not recognized under 10 until two decades after Spitz's descriptions. They didn't recognize kids under 10 could be depressed. It took the configuration of the medications and the physiology and so on. It's kind of sad, isn't it? But um, we're still struggling with this feature of being able to be compassionate and realize that and so much of that. Alicia, in her wonderful lecture, instantiated. It's tough. It's even now tough. Uh, and when, when I first showed the movies, Spitz's movies, I used to teach a first year course in development in medical school. The first time I did it, kids would be laughing, some of them. They'd be giggling, and, I, and they, I was shuddered, and I realized I hadn't prepared them for what they were going to see. And the, there was the anxiety laughter, anxious laughter. Didn't do that a second time <laughs> when I did the next class. I told them this story, and I told them how painful it is and would be when they would see it in situations of deprivation and child maltreatment. And I never, we could always hear a pin drop then. Uh, so it's difficult. Spitz contributed to the recognition of suffering in infancy. Our next pioneer is Salma Freiberg that I want to highlight again. She pointed to suffering in relationships. 
profoundly. Infant mother, uh, mother grandparents, and others. And she really used and made come alive. She was so gifted in description as well as her clinical work and be able to convey that. She conveyed the psychoanalytic concept of transference where relationships get repeated, even surprisingly in her work, in short-term uh, treatment situations with mothers and the metaphor of ghosts in the nurseries that you brought alive for us so nicely from Harris and from her uh, that, and, uh, that need to be countered with some angels. <laughs> um, and she brought that alive and showed how it repeated and ghost, this wonderful metaphor that actually had been a psychoanalytic metaphor before that. Um, just extraordinary. Uh, and she also conveyed so poignantly to a larger public, was able to convey the findings of psychology of Piaget that were complex uh, with the magic years, she called it, the inner experience that babies must be going through with their mothers under varying conditions and the inner conflicts of mothers and their relationships with their mothering and transferred to being reenacted in the nursery and as ghosts, as it were. Uh, and then that that could be brought into daylight with things that were reenacted with her or with a therapist. Uh, surprisingly, right there often in what she called kitchen therapies and other forms. Uh, and she remember had this phrase we all love to use, I hope, you know, that when you're working with an infant and a mother and a caregiver, uh, you, you really got stuff going for you because it's like having God on your side, she said, because the rapid development of the infant, and you can sew it, show it, show it how, how that baby's responding to that mother and that father, and wow, they see how things happen when you respond and so on. Yeah, so, but the, the deck nut pot and other pioneers I want to recognize that led up to this convening of frontiers that we tend to forget. The pediatric pro, uh, pioneers, um, obviously, Selma Freiburg, social worker, analytic train. We had people from many disciplines. Pediatric, there's a big deal going on in pediatrics in the decades leading up to this. Uh, an appreciation of the positive responsiveness of babies and all they could do. And of course, Barry Brazelton was a extraordinary uh, influence on so many of us, showing what babies could do and and came to realize he and his wonderful group of colleagues and students who were present at this meeting, as you'll hear, uh, showing uh, the wonderful things and, and the ways that that could enhance development and caregiving relationships, other than what people had thought in pediatrics and broader. And there was a big movement to improve hospital settings uh, in ways to encourage parent interactions. It used to be that babies and mothers were separate for the first two days. And often th this would be, mothers would be hospitalized even separate from their babies for three, five days and lying in in some places even 10 days uh, before they went home. Uh, and the, the uh, importance of showing parent receptiveness in this time and of course the pioneers, I mentioned Barry Brazelton with his assessment scale with using then moms, using it with moms and dads and showing the positive interventions that could take place in micro form. Edie Jackson, who founded Rooming In at Yale, she was also born and came back to Colorado later and I knew these people very well. And she was the founder of Rooming In and showing the benefits of babies being able to be with their mothers right soon after birth and staying with them. And you didn't get more disease and infection like the pediatrics thought, you got less. And uh, John Kennel and Marshall Klaus uh, showing more of that and really doing a lot of action work, changing nursery environments so that there's more opportunity for uh, togetherness for skin-to-skin -skin contact and eye contact 
and the whole humanization of the newborn nurseries was taking place leading up to this meeting. And wonderful Hanish Papashek. Mechtild, where are you? Mechtild is here. <laughs> Mechtild Papashek. Uh, Hanish, we lost. You'll see in memorial in a minute. Uh, he and Mechtild were at both uh, the uh, meetings in uh, Portugal. And gosh, their presence was uh, fully where they talked about the importance of interactions you'll hear. He had been studying uh, here in Prague, wonderful work with uh, another a colleague, District Hover. You told me she's still with us at 96 or something. It's wonderful. Uh, they did pioneering work in showing the remarkable learning capacities if we take into account them with caregivers and supporting caregivers that were present in infancy. And then with Mechtild, uh, their work together showing intuitive parenting, the fact that there was a biological preparedness in parents as well as infants for the togetherness, for the optimal ways of learning and using language with baby talk, yes, and the way the baby was held and the exact accommodation abilities that babies had and the rate of speech and so many of these wonderful things that fit. And they presented wonderful papers on what happens <clears throat> when there's interactional disruptions under varying circumstances and how that could be corrected. Uh, and so another thing that led up to this Frontiers meeting were a lot of advances in developmental psychology that were, recur were recurring uh, on, on many fronts uh, that move well beyond uh, the concern just with outside behavior, uh, the exploring the and realizing the capacities that infants had for intentionality, for responsiveness, for feelings then becoming more accepted as things you just don't throw out in development but are an important part of development. And I feature here uh, one of our colleagues, she couldn't be here because she's in Hong Kong, I think, right now, uh, Joy Osofsky, who was very prominent in these early meetings and also edited some major volumes summarizing the work in psychology that was a prelude, again, uh, in these areas that I just mentioned that led up to this. So this Congress took place, and I'd just like to mention quickly, I'm not going to evoke for reasons of time, but you might be interested in going back and looking at these. The shared excitement that took place when we came together, I was there, uh, and I know all these people uh, knew them. Uh, just to give you a flavor of what happened, uh, Margaret Mahler spoke about integrating the new knowledge about infancy with her ideas of separation and individuation. Selma Freiberg, described her experiences with treatment modalities over the previous decade with vivid vignettes of mother-infant parent therapy and what she called, she called them the unnatural therapies, sort of, you know, talking against the grain of what was usually done, in which she explained transferences, um, that is the ghosts in the nursery that went across generations and showed up in treatment relationships with her. Dan Stern and his groups presented on affect attunement for the first time and early emotional communications. And our group presented on emotional availability, social referencing, uh, and the notion of an affective self in infancy. Barry Brazelton and many of his group presented on assessment and treatment for newborns uh, and in the uh, NICU, the neonatal intensive care units. Other major presentations came from the following. Just listen to the list. Jerome Bruner, Robert Hind, John Kennel, Arthur Parmalee, Peter Gorski, Leon Chrysler, Bertrand Cromer, Serge Levici, Klaus Mindy, Tiffany Field, Michelle Soule, Miriam David, Elizabeth Fiva, I just saw her earlier. She, she may have had to leave early, and many others. Interestingly, it was the very early days of appreciation of attachment theory. Uh, Mary Main and Jude Cassidy presented uh, the first glimmers 
of understanding the consequences of children at six years who had different attachment patterns manifest in their relationships in infancy. But the move to representation had not yet occurred and was to come a few years later uh, in an SRCD monograph that I had the pleasure of editing. But I wanted to also evoke Eric Erickson again and use that as a major theme for our reflections. He himself uh, sort of immersed himself in the first Congress uh, and reflected in various ways that were uh, brought up in the book on his discussions. Uh, and he wrote a reflective piece of his experience that appears at the end of the first volume. Uh, and he provided challenges for our emerging field that I take as follows. I'm putting a little bit of a different words on it because he used some of the old fashioned, uh, he was relating to psychoanalytic words that we that don't have this much meaning now, but I, know, I, I think this was his intention. The first was, the first challenge was to understand more about the developmental process from infancy to after, uh, particularly emphasizing biology, or actually what he referred to as instincts at the time, in relation to his psychosocial polarities. And the second challenge was to understand more about the development of morality in the midst of our new knowledge about infancy. And I'm going to return to this in my, when I end this talk. Um, so um, there was enthusiasm, just to give you a little quick sense, uh, at these meetings of the growing field. And it was difficult to categorize in the volumes all that went on was thrown together. People were coming together with all this new knowledge and their clinical experience and meaning and appreciation that it could really work. There was suffering that we could address, take care of, and, and share with each other and move forward with. And so it was organized into these different uh, categories in the volumes. And uh, I'd already touched on this. Why was it called infant psychiatry? It's a, you know, it could have been called infant psychoanalysis, but of course that would have been worse. And I uh, uh, sense that uh, this, it's a theme of clinical meaning. That's what was vital. Many disciplines were there, many disciplines besides psychiatry. And in fact, it was captured by another hero that I'm going to feature briefly, another pioneer who uh, kept going with us in the transition. Serge Lebovici came up with this term. He said, look, we're all involved. Yeah, it's psychoanalysis, it's psychiatry, whatever you want to call it. We're involved in a trans discipline. It's involving the meaning for all of us. And again, I think it's the clinical meaning he was capturing. And so this is Serge. Uh, you've heard about him in, in some of the earlier, the Serge of Epovici Award. What a wonderful man that went to Bernard Goltz so appropriately who worked with him. Uh, he was, his importance in our organization, uh, just, it's hard to uh, overstate. Uh, in his mild and effective way and all that he contributed. When he came to us, he had already been president of the International Psychoanalytic Association. He was president in forming the multi-axial system of uh, ICD, he working with people who were not analysts, Michael Rudder and many others. Um, and so he came with us and he hosted and organized the Second Congress and brought so many of co his colleagues that made the one in Cannes, France, successful. And he served as the fifth president of WAPAD. Um, so, you know, I'm going to read all these, but they're available. These are the contributors that I, I just selected earlier who were there. It's a rather amazing group of people. And as I said, I, I think I counted that of the ones that I highlighted uh, here, gave major, major presentations. Um, something like 60% of them had, had analytic training, including most of the pediatricians, by the way. Barry Brasselton had and others. Um, and so, uh, under this name, uh, World Association of Infant Psychiatry, we changed it to Allied Disciplines, a group of us, uh, soon after. They asked me, I was a young investigator, they thought it would be good to have, so they involved me and I'd already had a role, administrative role with the Sleep Society <laughs> earlier. So they had me, uh, as, asked me if I'd be president-elect and worked with James Anthony. So I was the uh, 
fourth president and Serge was the fifth president. And then um, we flourished and I told you the story again, we joined with, and with, uh, with High's leadership especially, we got together and we became WAME, joining the international infant group. And, and um, these are key people. This is Justin Cole, that's me by the way, we headed a committee to do this. But this guy here, there he is. I, I'm keeping it away from your eyes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, was a major organizer, and he and I cooked this up a lot. And these are, here's Charlie Zena, Miguel Hoffman, I don't think he's here. This is uh, Isako Watanabe, who is here with us today. Kathy Barnard, who we lost recently. This is Eleanor Galenson, that's Serge. This is Joy Osofsky. She then became the first official president of WAME with a new organization. And this is Michel Soule. And uh, this is Peter de Chateau, Yvonne Boutier. And uh, I mentioned those because you uh, know any of you, all of them. Um, in the early years, just to remember, we had all kinds of regional meetings. Uh, we haven't had those recently, so I'm mentioning it to a little nudge for us whether we want to be able to go in those directions again of smaller groups of faculty we would assemble. Uh, they were pay-as-you-go uh, meetings, uh, and uh, but they were very successful, off, typically in cooperation with other groups uh, that had similar interests and some of the organizers. And I wanted to put this up there. These are major presenters who are no longer with us in memoriam. And uh, I've organized them in a list here uh, that goes uh, to most recently uh, Peter D. Chateau, Arthur Parmalee, John Kennel. Um, so quickly as I need to wrap up here, I want to move to the arc of history and where we are now. This has been a wonderful Congress. And I've heard continuing discussions which carry forth uh, this theme of clinical meaning. What is the experience of the baby? What is the experience of us with the baby? What is the experience of the caregivers with the baby? What is the experience of the family as the baby develops? Uh, and concerns about that. What are our obligations? And how do we make our, we have these major uh, opportunities and major uh, challenges as we go forward. Erickson's challenges, let me just mention those quickly if I can. You know, we're in the midst of all profound, increasingly organized complexity of development and our understanding more about it from the uh, biological sciences, biology writ big to include everything, the human genome, just some indications I've got to move. Look at the complexity. 10 to the 11th, or that's, you know, 10 billion, trillion neurons in the brain, and all these synaptic connections with each one. The move now to do the connectome, it's not, it's, it's less important what the places are that are emerging in fMRI than in comparison what the importance will be, where, where they go and what's connected and how we link them to neuroreceptors which can be influenced in various ways, not just by medication, but other aspects of what we do and so on. It's, it's a huge uh, frontier. Uh, I've been interested in apoptosis. I mean, you realize the turnover of cells in our body are, are extraordinary. And we're just touching the beginning of the iceberg of knowing about that, uh, particularly in molecular cancer research. And the same with the microbiome. Uh, one of our members, Infant Mental Health, the editor of our Infant Mental Health Journal, also has a microbiome center and is looking in that direction. Um, our job from the point of view of clinical meaning obviously is how to translate these and other complexity findings to meaning. Psychological meaning at the individual level, the subjective level, meaning at the relational level, intersubjective and shared. And again, one of my themes and awareness is that all of our interventions, all of our interventions involve the effects of relationships on other relationships. That could be a 
a day's talk in its own right. And we're more and more now learning to bring our clinical meaning perspectives into the community interventions. What is the meaning for the community? We're interested in that or discussions here in this Congress, in our board meeting, to what extent it will lead into uh, the presidential symposium. Can we act as individuals in a shared way with our organization and be effective at that level? And I just want to highlight something that I've been fundamentally uh, interested in in the last decade or so and have been uh, talking and writing about, and that is morality and development, Erickson's other challenge. We've Surprisingly, you may not realize it, but there's been a huge sea change from the point of view of biology and philosophy about thinking of morality. Uh, so long, it was dominated by rationality, rational decisions about willfulness and so on. But an appreciation of the fundamental social emotional uh, relation of morality that of the universal functions that begin early, uh, much of which uh, are not conscious, uh, that are nonverbal, they're fast acting, uh, and it's being become aware in many fields, and that there are th three universal adaptive functions uh, that are there. And I refer to them because it's kind of a nice acronym uh, which from the Latin roots you can think is reverence. <laughs> uh, R-E-V, moral functions. R is for reciprocity. So let's think about that. Universal in all moral systems that we know of, there's some version of the golden rule, turn-taking. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Reciprocity. Darwin had it there as well. He recognized that. Another one, E is for empathy. Now, you don't have full-blown empathy as we know it, of course, but the, in infancy already, social communication is going on. Actually, talking earlier with uh, Isako Watanabe, even in the womb, but demonstrably, and we can show uh, right after birth, there's, there is uh, an emotional, powerful communication that babies come with. They cry to other babies, and other babies start crying in the nursery, they'll cry. This is powerful communication, let alone what it shows to mothers and fathers if, uh, if we allow and nourish that. And the, 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 the V I put is for evaluation, um, and I use that. That's, these, are, these first terms, Darwin has empathy in there too, as a universal moral function. All of them have a universal moral function that goes something like uh, do not harm others uh, in, in some way or another. I think that was taken up in the first plenary talk, actually, which I didn't hear all of, but I was hearing echoes of um, from Abraham and so on. And valuation I use to cover another big feature that is uh, full of the major uh, developmental theories. Piaget called it a cognitive assimilation. Uh, it's the basic tendency babies are born with to take in new things in the world, to seek out the new in order to make it familiar, to get it right about the world. They're, they're mastering the world right from the get-go. And, and Piaget built a little scheme, a long scheme, very elaborate scheme, calling cognitive assimilation, which he called the basic fact of life. That's, this is the basic thing of all my theories. It's there. So babies are taking in standards from the surround, from parents, from us, about the way the world should be internalizing that. Well, I've come to think of them with a useful metaphor. There are endowments from our evolutionary biology. They're there in infancy. They continue in development, and they continue developing. There's a lot more to morality, to these functions that continue in development. We're not going to talk about that, but it's a core for development, present in infancy and in us. And just to remind uh, here uh, are the functions that I was just describing verbally. Uh, but they have deficit and excess. They're subject, like all regulatory functions, 
uh, too enough and too much. There's a golden mean. All regula regulatory systems work towards the middle of polarities, which were discussed a lot of these early Congresses, not only by Erickson, but by Lewis Sander. And some of, what, some of his best, pa best paper ever wrote, I think, was at our Congress uh, on this topic. They're there throughout life, these polarities. We struggle with them. So you can have deficits in each one, which are problematic, maladaptive. You could have excesses. And I've just indicated some of those. We don't have time to. And there's a dark side. There's a dark side, as you know. It'll, I, I can't imagine it's not going to come up in the presidential symposium. The dark side of turn-taking is retribution and revenge. And in fact, we heard a little clinical example, I think, that you shared with us, Alicia. Um, retaliation, conflict, and violence, and how it relates to territoriality and so on. And emotional now, uh, in terms of the E, the emotional communication or the empathy part, knowing how to hurt others can be a dangerous thing. Uh, there's a tendency in all of us for schadenfreude, demonizing the outgroup, so on. Uh, and evaluation, uh, fundamentally, as we've learned from the cognitive linguistic sciences, involves categorizing. It's a basic thing we do. We teach babies, both automatically and inadvertently and consciously, uh, to label things. This is the way science progresses step by step. But when you do that, you categorize things, uh, you have downsides to that in terms of bias and prejudice, what we teach them about the other. And of course, self-righteousness. That's the one that keeps ringing up in me all the time. It frightens me sometimes, my own self-righteous indignation. So let's get to this point. As clinicians, we, ha we are using our moral, coral in our moral core in development, these REV functions. And I'm thinking more and more about that in my teaching and my just thinking and maybe some of my writing. Uh, reciprocity is our engagement. Our clinical meaning is in the responsivity that we're having with our patients and our families and with others. That's the reciprocity, that's the turn-taking. We see Spitz saw those babies weren't reciprocal, weren't turn-taking with him. He felt the empathy, terrible pain and sadness, as well as what could happen with a reunion. And the clinical evaluation, part of our V, we bring all our knowledge that we're learning from infant mental health to bear. Just to remind us, it's coming to our organization. I'm leading now up to the next talk, symposium. We just published this paper in our newsletter, right? Paper on the rights of infants. We're going into a new realm. We're joining a realm of social responsibility. Uh, and now we're trying to figure out what do we do with it? Uh, how much are our organization is going to become more than information exchange, sharing with each other, stimulating research, colleagueship, setting up initiatives, and so on, but basically information exchange. How much can we do, and how will we get the resources to do it, and who are we going to cooperate with? Uh, this is coming up, discussions among us in this meeting, in the board. So we're facing new horizons, and I would say, obviously, you're hearing how much I look forward, and I think we all look forward, to the presidential session of Miri Karen, Building Empathy Beyond Barriers and Borders, Infant Mental Health, Professionals' Role with Israeli-Palestinian Conflicts, and the remarkable way that Miri and Sam Tiano and others have built into the fabric of this meeting that theme, and it builds, and it gets in our compassion, and it gets under our skin, and it's, here we are. So, one more thought, you know, as Steve Jobs used to like to say, one more thought. What occurred to me late last night is how much we're a part of the world now. Even though we have all this connectedness, we're also more isolated. Connectedness through social media, we're also more isolated. You know, I was going to demonstrate that by holding my cell phone up here instead of looking at you. That's a downside. 
we're seeing that all around, terrible consequences, downside. Ah, so anyway, we're thinking, and I was thinking of this quote, which I've often thought about from an American playwright, Arthur Miller, the fish is in the water, the water in the fish, showing how much we're immersed in our environment. So I've talked about this in different groups, and uh, the but there, uh, family therapist colleagues reminded me of the following. Don't forget the importance of boundaries. Hmm? Without boundaries, there'd be no fish. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's yours. Oh, do we have time? Oh, wonderful. So I'm a good. I didn't know how well behaved I'd be. I'd planned, hopefully, to have time for questions and discussions, and we do. Wonderful. Um, questions, comments about the meeting, about our frontiers, about where we'd like to go, or about anything I said. Hi. What do you, uh, based on this history, what do you consider to be the major set of issues that we need to come to How far, I, I think it's where I was finishing, how far can we go as an organization well, there are two things. One is uh, to, to stay with the theme of clinical meaning. Um, I think one is the frontier that we need to, and it's happening with reflective supervision and all the discussions here about that, but I think we need to go even further uh, and continually examine ourselves in our clinical meaning world. Uh, what is our stance. The, the morality is developing and these rev functions and their more uh, complex evocations with shame and guilt and a whole bunch of other things later in development, they're still developing within us. And I'm amazed at uh, some of my colleagues, some of my practitioners, practitioners continue functioning when they're trained in isolation and don't build in reflective supervision or some way of support and reflecting about uh, our moral stance and what is aroused in us uh, in our work at the time and, and are we doing the best that we can uh, in terms and thinking most, re most recently about how, like say in psychotherapy or individual consultations we're affecting other relationships in the world around us. Um, so I think there's one frontier uh, that we need to continue to be active in, that is self-reflection in terms of uh, our moral stance as we're moving forward in this complex world. Uh, more broadly and more urgently and more relevant to the next symposium is how we can uh, do more uh, together as an organization. Uh, I think there's an organizational crisis here. How much can we do uh, and how do we do it with limited resources now? Do we get more resources to do it? Um, I, uh, my own view is that we can do a lot more with cooperation and collaboration. So with infant rights, um, I would see the real importance of collaborating with the group that is already uh, extending and revising the uh, UN Convention on Human Rights. We need to join them actively and get going and involve our young people especially uh, in that, in the leadership, uh, collaborative work with maybe with UNESCO and other organizations um, to join. Uh, and then we have big issues. Uh, are we as an organization going to develop resources to be able to do more ourselves with and without collaboration. And I know 
the board is taking that up now. Uh, but we've only developed resources mainly to communicate with each other up to now. Right, Mary? So I, th I see these are big issues and, and, and we're going to be right in the middle of that, I think. Right? Uh, we have all this love and compassion, but now, okay, what are we going to be able to do? What can we do? Accepting our own limitations as well as, our, including morally, when we get aroused, you know? Um, these are big, this is a big frontier. What do you think? He agrees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that would be nice. Thank you. So this was really great. Um, I was so happy to be able to hear you give one of your master lectures in this context, knowing over the years how often you have given them in the psychoanalytic society um, setting. But I've rarely had this pleasure um, with you, so thank you. Um, over the last couple of years, I've gotten very engaged in my local situation of reaching out to parents directly through um, the uh, internet, through engaging parents in baby groups. And what I've become very aware of is that um, our professional associations, as you just said, spend so much time talking to each other. And um, I want to know when can these professional organizations begin to have public health messages large-scale public health messages to get this information out to the public. Because, you know, all of us, you know, experience when we give a class, a, a webinar, a, a public lecture, and parents come up and they, they get that insight. Oh, that's what's going to change the world, not us talking to each other. And um, where can that go? What, what are the public health venues that we can use? I, think, I feel like I'm building on what Hai was saying, but I think that it's something that can be crystallized and become very effective. Coming from multiple directions, because my first uh, evocation, obviously, is terribly important. Uh, thank you for that. Um, zero to three another organization that I'm involved with, has that as a top priority. And uh, within North America especially, now they want to become more international and join with us in many ways. Uh, that's, that's their main priority. And their web page, and they're now revising it, and, and the materials they have are wonderful to do just that. But there's a concern still there that it's not working enough uh, for parents. So recently they just did a, a series of surveys of the millennial parents, the parents of action now, you know, come into being since the, this century. <laughs> and um, so they did a lot of uh, focus groups and so on, so they came up with some interesting things that parents said, um, we don't like to be told things from up there. Uh, there was a lack of trust uh, from people preaching at them. Now this is, a, this is a, actually I should point out in the United States right now, which is getting a little spooky about government and things like that. But, um, but it's real as well. Um, well, it's not as well. <laughs> um, so it was that, and they, they said, we have a lot to offer. And we, we keep getting the feeling that we're being talked to. Very interesting. So there's now a set of thinking and initiatives. How can we develop response to that that is meaningful for them? They said they would like to more and more uh, have groups with each other, because in the course of doing the survey, 
the usual survey stuff methodology, which leaves me cold, you know, calling and all that stuff. Uh, they used focus groups, a lot of focus groups. And they organized them in a different way because they had um, parents, uh, young parents were identified, and just bring your friends in to your home and we'll have a focus group there. And they had one of their people of this survey company come in and be the outsider in the focus group. But otherwise, it was parents talking to each other. Uh, and they liked that very much. And they got a lot of, uh, across these many, many groups, uh, positive feedback. We'd like to do more of that. So they're thinking of, how can we do more of that? This so-called, uh, there's a, what is it called, Hi, There's a technique that's used that the uh, um, cafe, was it cafe interventions or something like that? It's a, the what? Global cafe? World Cafe. Well, it should be their neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they're going to see if they can implement something. But it's interesting that it's not as simple either as, as you indicated, getting the public health messages out there. Uh, there's a whole field now of called implementation science as to how to really involve communities from the get-go all through and have sustainability and effectiveness in different communities. You do it working with people as colleagues all along the way in communities, as you know. Community-based participatory research. Yeah. So, but that, thank you for that question, both of them. Comments? Press your button. <laughs> so thank you very much, um, Bob. It's been a really e extraordinary presentation and there are many challenges for us and especially the challenge to use our modes of communication for collaboration um, and for understanding the meaning of that um, as we move forward. So thank you very much. So I invite you to show your appreciation for Bob the man. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.